they came They found her dancing on a chair She hadn't slept for days And there was blood still in her hair She took a mirror from the wall A thousand pieces flew But it didn't smash her feelings she hoped that it might do Dr Rufus May works as a clinical psychologist in Bradford. He was once diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, but he hasn't taken any medication in 22 years. I see terms like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder not as conditions really, but as labels. Diagnoses that we use to try and understand people, but they don't really get to the root of what's going on. They're just categories that we put people into. And what we really need to look at is a much more holistic way of understanding people. So a holistic model um, has a different way of looking at illness. Rather than trying to categorise it, what we try and do in a holistic approach to illness is to we see the illness as part of a healing process. So. If somebody has a cold, they need to take it easy and drink lots of water, flush the toxins out. So in the same way with a mental health problem, it's a way of the body trying to release toxins. So we need to work with those, that release of toxins, not against it. Whereas the medical model tries to suppress symptoms. The medical model uh, tries to dampen down the experience, put it back in a box. The only problem with that It'd be fine if it worked, but what seems to happen is if we medicate away the distress or the madness, um, it tends to come back. It might come back in another way, so we suppress it with drugs, but then the person has loads of apathy and feels really helpless and, and thinks, what's the point in my life? Or they might get really overweight and develop diabetes and a heart condition. So the approach I prefer is that we try and really listen to the experience and work with it rather than against it. So we don't try and suppress it. We stop having a war on our terror. When they put me on the lithium, they said that it would decrease my episodes. But what they didn't tell me was that if I didn't take the lithium, my episodes would get worse than they ever had been. Like I'd be getting seriously ill. Like, whereas before I might be a little bit crazy, nut nut lady, now, now I'm getting really ill. If somebody came to me with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and they said, Rufus, I want to come off my medication, what I'd say to them is, well, that's a big thing um, and we need to look at that. And medication, if it's helpful, is going to be suppressing thoughts and feelings. Even if it's not helpful, it'll be doing that. And so if you want to rely less on it, reduce it or come off it, then you need to learn other ways to manage your emotions your moods, your thoughts. And, you know, of course, it's, it's hard on the kids. I've got five children. The eldest is 23. And basically, no one's ever explained it to them until I was put in lithium. And then I had a doctor who said, actually, my brother's got bipolar. And it's like, I've got bipolar? But I wasn't getting any counselling or anything like that, even though I'd been in and out of the hospital, so I didn't know what was going on. And it was only once I was put on the lithium, it's like, because I'm taking their drug, they'll bring me into the fold. Before my breakdown, I'd never had any sort of mental illness before, but the ending of a long-term relationship had sent me off the rails and into what my therapist had explained was some early trauma from my childhood, which had resulted in a form of post-traumatic stress. I shook constantly so that people were always asking me if I was cold and I was experiencing what she explained were flashbacks and these would overtake me on an almost daily basis and make me feel violently suicidal. There are very few places where anyone struggling with anything like this can go for respite, especially if you can't afford private care. But one day, when I really thought I was losing my mind, I took myself along to a place that I'd heard about in North London called Maytree. It said it was a sanctuary for the suicidal where people could stay for up to four nights and it was completely free. 
it looked just like an ordinary house and there were nice rooms for the guests as we were called and people to talk to night and day about how you were feeling if you wanted to. And there was this wonderful woman called Paddy Baisley who was one of the directors. At Maytree, we wanted to provide somewhere where people can feel safe, where they can think for a bit of time about life and death, and where they can actually talk about it. Maytree doesn't offer respite as such because it's actually hard work here. People are encouraged to talk about what has brought them to the point of wanting to end their lives. Suicidal people feel utterly hopeless. And it's about a transfusion of hope. It's about giving something of yourself to another human being who is feeling desperate and despairing. It must be genuine. It must be because you really, really believe it. No point giving false hope. No point trying to cheer people up. Lots of people do that. But it really is about giving something from you to another person. Matri is run by a small team of full-time people, plus something like 90 volunteers, who are kind, thoughtful, and interested in the guests. They're very experienced in terms of being with suicidal people, and they may have some sort of awareness of their own madness or potential for madness or depression or suicidality. It was important to create a safe physical space to reflect the safety that we're offering in the psychological and emotional sense. Um, people so often fear madness. They fear falling apart. And it's important that Maitri can hold both physically and emotionally, people in that, who are feeling like that. Staying there gave me personal experience of what can work for people like myself, who feel actively suicidal on an almost daily basis. What can calm us down? What can lessen our fears? And what can give us just a little bit of hope to help us survive through to the next day? So why couldn't a psychiatric hospital, staffed by dozens of psychiatric nurses, presumably at enormous cost to the NHS, do just any one of those things? On one of my ward rounds, the doctor said, I hear that you've been self-harming. Is this true? Yes, just a bit. Oh, don't show me. I don't want to see. And I always found that reaction quite strange. but for whatever reason, I still needed to do it. But I soon found a way of getting the nurses off my back. What have you done? Oh, they're just superficial cuts, and I did them yesterday. Oh, okay then. And then they leave you alone because you'd reassured them that it hadn't happened on their shift, so they couldn't be held responsible. All the staff on the ward seemed to have such a huge problem around people who self-harmed. After I left hospital, I interviewed a woman called Pam Blackwood, who had been head of operations at Samaritans for six years. She was also a member of the guideline development group on the 2005 NICE report on self-harm. For many years, I worked as a self-harm care manager in a hospital, and for many people who I saw, the intention was suicide. But I also saw a lot of people whose intention was not suicide and they're the people that we would now say self-harm. I think one of the difficulties is that nursing is about medicine and you might choose to go into psychiatry but it's still about treating people with medicine and making them better and that's the reward of the job. But if, if there's somebody who's a so-called revolving door patient and people who self-harm often are, then there's a sense of impotence I think sometimes um, because it, the nurses feel, well, my skills aren't helping and therefore I feel bad. But for other nurses, I actually think there may be something punitive. And I, I really wouldn't want to generalise, but 
if a nurse feels that self-harm isn't a mental illness and therefore you shouldn't be here because you're taking up a bed from somebody with schizophrenia who I know I can help or do something for, then that's the thought process that actually gets them to be punitive in some way. I don't think medication will stop people self-harming. It's about refuge. That's what people need. Self-harm is a way of coping with unbearable pain, which isn't a medical condition. Hospital is no place for an ill person. As the weeks went by, I realised that however much I hated that place, I was also scared of leaving it too. For the entire length of my stay, no member of staff ever asked me why I'd taken an overdose, why I felt suicidal, why my legs seemed to collapse whenever I was in distress. They never asked me where my terrifying flashbacks might be coming from or why I had the need to self-harm so often. Patients were confined and medicated, and that was all. As professionals, if we diagnose someone, it sort of immunises us against their distress. We could say, oh, that's so typically bipolar or schizophrenia, whatever it is, the label we've given them. And we don't have to go there to their pain and think about what's it like to fear the world's going to end. What would that be like for me? And so we remain detached. And we're good at that. We're good at that in Western culture and in Britain. We spent hundreds of years going around the world being macho, in our own way, exploiting other cultures and not really thinking about the consequences of that. So if we listen to distress, we have to listen to the consequences of exploitation, uh, of silencing people. But if we take that holistic approach to mental health, it doesn't really give a role for doctors, for psychiatrists, for the pharmaceutical industry, because we're going to use that technology a lot less if we're really connecting with people and helping them through their emotions and seeing meaning in them. There isn't really a role for doctors. They, their whole training is about diagnosing people and dosing them up on drugs. So there's an issue there. It happened long ago she liked to leave it far behind But the man who took her body Has her mind It happened long ago And the years have not been the man who took her body now has her mind.